Okay, next, 5G concepts. After we have talked about the technical requirements, now um, there are different concepts to realize a combination of the technical requirements. For example, the air interface is a needed or given thing that we have to change in order to get the latency down. Today's 4G air interface cannot be tuned or parameterized to um, get lower latencies uh, than 10 milliseconds. And the 5G air interface is a totally new design and, and with that we can achieve the new latencies. If you think about more throughput, resilience and security, something like multi-pass communication or multi-connectivity um, in the wire wireless world are needed to increase these factors. The mesh is something to think about energy, and then we have these three bullets over here, the CDN and ICN, and the network slicing in the mobile edge cloud. These are totally new concepts that um, we will introduce in a minute, and there will be dedicated lectures for this as well. So let's look into one of the things like multi-pass. What do we mean by that? So if you have a single pass and you just convey your six packet over a single pass, if you look at things like throughput, resilience, security, and latency, then you could say, okay, there's a very good efficiency on this pass because you're submitting six of them. Resilience is not as good because once you, you're losing your pass, the, combination, the communication is not there anymore. And security-wise, if you have only a single pass, the attacker knows that and will attack you exactly on this given pass. The latency I put here on yellow just to say, yeah, it's mediocre and let's compare it to other approaches. One of them is multi-pass with replications, which means we would send the same information over multiple passes, in this case three. And here what you see is um, six packet on the first, six packet on the second, and six packet on the third pass. Now the throughput is very bad, or let's say the efficiency of the throughput, because you're transporting three times the same, which will eating up the capacity of your network. Resilience is way better, because um, even if you lose one or two of the passes, and totally, there's still a third pass where the message will be conveyed. Security-wise, it's a dilemma because the attacker now will not only know over which pass you go, it will um, look into the weakest pass of all of the three. Latency-wise, this will not bring you any advantage, depending on the error characteristic of the packets. Uh, it might be that um, a multi-pass scenario with replication might be a little bit faster, but normally you will not improve the latency significantly. The other approach would be to t still use three passes, but now um, only convey a portion of the information per pass so that the throughput will go up to the optimal again, but now the resilience is very bad. The reason for that is um, it's not only that you can lose a pass. With the first pass you lose, the co whole combination is lost. Security-wise, it's very hard to attack because you need to attack um, all three passes. That's a little bit more tricky. But just to understand whether communication has taken place or not, um, then you will still select the weakest pass. Also, latency-wise here, it could improve the situation. As you can see here, you don't have to wait six packets. Here, you only wait two packets in parallel, three times, so six packets in parallel. Then it might um, help you a little bit, but if you are, have in a certain error pattern and you have to wait for the largest one, latency could be even worse than with a single pass. That depends, as always. Another way how you could use that is similar to the first uh, to the approach we described before, um, but this time instead of splitting the information, we would code the information. And here we could send um, two packets per pass or even three if you at once. Then you can deal with errors. And now um, we made everything green just to tell you there is a way to deal with all of that if you use a clever coding. Um, how to do this? And um, we'll show you later on. Good. Um, there are some examples for that. Um, the startup Mesmerize from this chair, they built a nice demonstration with multi-pass communication for drones, getting commu uh, communication over um, multiple um, access points that are close by. And what they showed is when you have such a scenario, then you will never lose the connectivity to the network as long as you have one pass active. 
The same you can th also think for um, for the industry environment. Here is a given scenario where you have some um, transportation robots on the ground, and normally they want to have a connection to the um, base station that is in the ceiling. But um, sometimes this leads to a situation where they cannot find an access point and they get stuck in one of the corridors. This is a real problem. Um, in reality, we are, um, was, were approached by companies to solve this issue. And one of the things is, of course, that these robots have some ground mesh situation with multipath. And now you can reach the, this kind of network over multipath from the top. As long as you get into the network, everything will be fine. So if you then look again on the evolution of the communication networks, here you see the circuit switched um, network for telephones. And um, this was historically um, done by um, certain steps. In the beginning, there were fully meshed um, situations where really every um, telephone was connected to other telephones. And this led to a lot of cabling within the city. Then you had centralized situation like this tower in the city of Stockholm, where you not have so many cables, but very long cables from your home to the switching tower. And instead of having one switching tower, what you see in the circuit switch networks, you have dedicated nodes with a lot of switching elements in the middle with hierarchical elements that um, can switch more and more um, of these um, phone calls. In the first place, this was done by, by um, human people and then afterwards it was done in, in other way, means. Here you see the fully meshed one for Stockholm and then, uh, sorry, in New York. This one is the star topology in Stockholm and here again the hierarchical network. Now, the, the internet came up with the idea to say if I have such an intelligent network with a lot of switching elements, um, there are some of the, these nodes, the super nodes, if you take them out of the network, then suddenly the network is not fully functional anymore. So if you look at the middle node here, if this would fail, the, there's no way that you can connect the devices to each other. And what they thought about is a new type of network, which is not circuit switched anymore, where you really cable physically uh, one pass from one telephone to the other. Now you would like to have something packet switched. And this packet switch works that somewhere the sender will enter some packets into the network and these routers in the middle will just pass on the information. And if one of the nodes goes down, you just find another way. And in order to keep this very resilient, of course, you are looking into multipath communication. Currently, the packet switch network or the internet is not using multipass, it's using only a single pass due to the problem of um, capacity. But uh, lately, there were some um, initiatives in the standardization where they really want to exploit multipass for communication networks. And why multipass has not been um, deployed is really capacity, but already in the 60s, there were some papers showing the resilience for a given mesh network. Here, for example, a uh, generalized mesh network with a sender on this side and a receiver with three passes between of them. And then the question is, will you find the three or four shortest passes uh, between them? Or do you have some perfect switching where you prior a priori know which nodes you should use for building up a route? and then it increased. But the best is the more passes you have will bring you to the best possible solution. And this will then end up in one minus the single node probability of failure. And this will have been shown by Paul Barron, 1964. Good. Multipass is not only something in um, communication networks. I mean, I brought you two examples. One is, for example, the brain, where the neurons also spawn multipass in case of danger. So if you, for example, take the hammer and smash it on the hand, you should never do this. But in case you do it, the pain information on the brain is really activating a lot of neurons, which is more or less a multipass scenario. And in the bottom, you see um, the pass routing for ants uh, for food retrieval strategies. They also have a multipass in the beginning, but there they only would like to exploit the um, area. And once they have found out the best way between the two entry points on the left and the right, um, they, become, they will degrade to um, something what we would call a single pass scenario. Okay, so much for the multipass. Um, for the concept, 5G concept of MASH, 
Um, I brought you this small video of Mesmerize. Again, you see the, this drone uh, with a multi-pass um, scenario, but what they do also, they spawn a mesh. And what uh, what you see here, two different um, deployments. One is a mesh with multi-pass and one without. And here you see the multi-pass, the drone is flying and flying, while here the blue drone is stopping because they lost the connectivity. Once it re it's rebuilt, you can start again, but once you lose it, it will always take time to rebuild the route. And in a mesh type with multi-pass, you see how stable it is and how the drone will fly and fly again. But this is not only done in a in a um, virtualized world. You see here a real world implementation where only one drone is flying, but you see the access points, the white boxes on the ground where the drone is flying and you see multi-pass connectivity um, to the access point and they are building also a mesh between them and then you see that sometimes the closer you get to one of the access points the better is the data rate for some of these okay then we come to a, a really new concept while multi-pass and also mesh is well known um, it's a, a new concept called network slicing network slicing is attacking the problem that i have already introduced with a trade-off of different parameters so you can only optimize for one of the parameters like latency or throughput or resilience. Network uh, slicing will tackle the problem in a totally different manner. So when you assume you have different um, devices, so smartphones or cars or even massive IoT devices, what you will see is you would need different networks for that. If you looked into the technical parameters, we have the certain areas for cars and um, for other services. You just look it up and you should have a network exactly for this given use case. As, uh, if you want to support all of them at the same time, as I said before, this will end up in a um, dramatic use of spectrum. What we are trying to do here is to share the spectrum and inside the shared spectrum we would um, have different type of networks. Some is optimized for data rates, the first slice for example. The second slice is optimized for latency and then the third slide is optimized for massiveness. So here instead of um, creating really physically independent um, networks, what you're doing here is a network slicing. The advantage is that you can shift now resources depending on the needs of the given slice. So you can create new slices or you can even um, extend them or even degrade them. Um, here's a, one example. You have seen it also before. Um, this is the Barcelona example where we have two slices, right? One slice has the autonomous driving and this slice um, says we need one millisecond um, latency and only 70 megabit per second throughput. With that, we can allow the cars to drive around 50 km per hour in the city. And for the people running around in the city, we have an entertainment slide, which has 220 megabit per second and 30 milliseconds latency. So latency is not so important for that, so we can be very reluctant on this parameter. So you have seen the, 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 um, the accident uh, here with the, with the truck. In the case, the fire workers will come and show up. You need a third slide for them. And now they would like to have the one millisecond because they have to fly the drones. They need also high throughput to get the f um, video feed from the drones into the cars. So they have priority and they will, they will get a lot of, of the spectrum of the wireless channel. Which will lead then for the entertainment slide that the latency goes even up higher, which is not a problem, but the throughput also is reduced by more than the half. This will end up in a quality reduction of the video. We made it here a little bit more dramatic that you can see it, but maybe it's not uh, 4K anymore, it's now HD or whatever. And for the cars, um, we have also the throughput, which is not so dramatic, but the latency went from one to four millisecond. And with that, the cars, as I explained before, the latency has an impact um, on the security zones of the cars. You see that the traffic in this area where we do the slicing, um, as we have seen it here, um, is the, the velocity of the cars is also reduced by the half, to the half. Good. Um, this is the again the Barcelona um, 
a video. Um, I think you have seen it. If you want to see it again, it's uh, on YouTube. It shows these two slices now activated, as I told you before. The video is good, speed is high. Now we have the accident. And what happens um, afterwards, all the people are coming, right? They make screens, they make some pictures and some videos, want to bring it up. And network still looks okay. The two slices are there because the fireworkers are not on the way yet. But once the fireworkers are on the way, this is now the case. You also see the drones flying in over here. Um, now they would require in this region a certain um, a certain third slide for public safety slide. Exactly what I said, one millisecond. And you see what it means for the cars and for the quality of the video, right? Let's just wait a little bit. So you see half of the speed. The video quality is very bad. But once this mess is cleaned up and the fireworkers will leave the scene, the drones will also fly away. After a certain time, everything will be back to normal. And of course, this third slide will be um, now deleted and all the capacity is giving back to the two slides that have been there before with the quality that you would expect. Okay, the other concept that is very interesting is the mobile edge cloud. While the network slicing was really focusing on the um, trade-off between the parameters, the mobile edge cloud is tackling one big problem, which is the latency. The latency is a problem because if we would have some computing somewhere in the back of the network, as we have, in, have it now, for example, in the US, and you would like to steer a car in uh, Europe, then there is something like 9,000 kilometer distance between them. And light only travels um, 300 kilometer per millisecond. That would mean you already will lose 30 milliseconds in this kind of communication. So the only possibility to reduce the latency is given by the solution that we have seen with the gamers, proximity. So what you would do is bring the computing as close as possible to the point where this is needed, right? Here's the PowerPoint uh, idea. It's a very rudimentary architecture, some base station, radio network controller, the old ones, right? And the green one is a cloud, but this cloud is too far away. So if you would need something, for example, steering a robot down here, you would move the computing as close as possible. In this case, it would be at the base station, right? And sometimes you even have two base stations serving you with multipass, more resilient, very good. But this idea of moving computing to a certain thing is already difficult in PowerPoint, but it's already even more difficult to make it happen in real life. Um, if you think about clouds, there are different kind of clouds, right? So clouds for storage, data, or for computing. The difference between storage and computing um, easily can be described as the one has a state, the other don't have a state. So if you look in the cloud with your holiday pictures, it's always the same cloud. So what can we do there? Uh, in the case of storage, we, I brought you some examples. Um, instead of having one cloud with a very long string um, for the storage, we could think about distributed clouds. So where we store data in different um, clouds and why should we do that? It's more or less the same question as in multipass, right? One of the things is uh, security, another one is resilience, and maybe also download speed from a distributed cloud. Here are some papers that we have um, contributed to the society um, some years back showing the advantage of that. So the motivation mainly was by students telling, hey, there are distributed storage clouds like Dropbox, SkyDrive, Google Drive, Box at the time. Why don't we store the, the information there? Um, because normally what they will ask you to do is put all your data in Dropbox. Once you have consumed all your capacity, you have to buy more. But if you get the free space on all of these devices, you can combine them now. Combination was the very first idea, so saving money. This led then to a startup called Chocolate Cloud that really made this kind of software happen. And here was a first a measurement campaign. What you see here is the number of packets you would like to get. 32 packets is 100% of the information. And the question is, how fast can you get it? So the longer you will take to reach the 32 packets, the longer you will wait for your information. And here you have four different clouds. You ask how many parallel downloads you want to have. Do you want to use a form of coding or not? 
and why you want to use this is pretty clear. Here you see um, no coding schemes. It takes a very long time to get your um, your data because you wait for the slowest cloud to deliver the given task. While with the coding, you will tell the clouds send as fast as you can, right? And here you see that also here it happens that sometimes in the end we are waiting only for the green one or only for the blue one, but this always changed. We could not say which of the clouds is very slower than the other. I brought you another example um, where we have four clouds here, and we said when we when we ask all the clouds and we assume that all clouds have all 32 packets, give me all your 32 packets. And once we are getting packets from all the sites, now they are coded, there is not the coupon collector problem, which means there are no duplicates. After getting 32 packets into the queue, we know that we have it all, and this would be the time for downloading. That it continues here is just for us to understand why certain clouds are delivering very fast and a lot, or fast and nothing. <coughs> and here, a little bit later, but a lot of data, or very late and nearly nothing. And if you then look into um, how many packets should I really store here? Here we had 32 in all of the clouds, but this is costly. Um, how much should I really, from the 32, give uh, for each of the clouds? And then you see this is the download speed now. For five uh, clouds, here we had only four. But if you take five and you ask yourself, how fast can I get my data back from the clouds? Then it's very interesting to see if you do it in a scheduled way compared to a coded way, the coded way is way better. Not only that the mean value is better, also the variance is better. And this um, prevents customers to call you because the uh, service is really bad, which could be the point up here, right? So the other thing that you see is the less you store in the clouds, the worse becomes your download, which is clean, clear because if you give it, um, let's say only a quarter, in this case to all of them, you will you would need until the last one gave it all to you. You get a speed up if the clouds have a little bit more, and therefore you have this big race here, and then continuously get better, better, better. That is nearly the same for the scheduling until you reach a certain um, plateau over here. Now the other thing is this is download speed. The costs are better when you go into this direction. Um, the problem of um, resilience, of course, is better when you go into that direction. The more you store, the better it is. But even if you look at security, um, you don't want to put all the information on each of the clouds because Dropbox in the beginning always had uh, open days where everybody can look into, the, um, into their folders, into your folders. Then it's really good to at least have one part of the information in another cloud. So going from 32 to 31 already increase your secu security significantly. Um, as we have five, and um, we would say, okay, everybody has seven more or less. Um, the another point would be here after 25. If you go 24, there's even more security, and then so on in 17 and 10 and so on. So this is security means put less packets into that. Um, Resilient tells you take more packets into the cloud. The cost will tell you to take less into the cloud, and the downloads will say put more packets into the cloud. Um, that's again a designer design issue, but it shows nicely how, what you can do, right? How can you increase this? It's very easy for storage. The problem now is the mobile edge cloud is not only having storage, it also has computing. Can I do the same trick with storage? No, unfortunately not. Because if I would have a controller um, for a cyber physical system in two different clouds, computing the same, um, it's based on the feedback, what they would decide for the next. As long as the feedback is the same, they would behave and they're in sync. But once you give um, error prone or um, you have lost feedbacks, then these two clouds will have different meanings. And then you would need more of these clouds doing something like this. In airplanes, we have such a scenario where we have five different computers calculating something and then they make a majority of vote what to do. <clears throat> Now, the other thing is where to place the computing. Um, if you place it very close at the base station, that's very good for the latency, but it's very bad because this computing only has an oversight about the cars in the neighborhood of the space station. If you place it a little bit in the back, then you would have more information for more cars and you can make maybe wiser decisions, uh, but the latency is not as good. So precision goes up, 
latency goes up. If you would do it in the end, then the latency would be so bad you could not reach anything, but at least you would have a very good overview. And this is what TMC is to doing today. So traffic management uh, control for your cars, sometimes you see it. They have all the cars in Europe under control and tell you where to route it. There, the latency is not an issue, but if you want to steer a, a car over the intersection, it's very good to do it here at the car. Such a mobile edge cloud can be um, built on very low cost um, things here. What you see is a bunch of Odroids, nothing else than a Raspberry Pi on speed. Um, here we have 32 um, Raspberry Pis, uh, sorry, Odroids that could calculate. And what we do here sometimes is to place the computing at the right um, device and also try something with distributed computing in such a device. Um, something that we can see also here in the lab. There have been several um, implementations for the Mobile Edge Cloud to show the impact. One of the first demos here was the Mobile Edge Cloud demo for the Deutsche Telekom, for the IFA. And uh, what we did is we um, implemented our own game, a Tron-like game. I think everybody knows it. You have two uh, worms that are um, starting and they should never crash into the borders of the game or into the tail of the other worm. And um, what you see here is the game and the game server can be hosted at different places. For example, in Sydney, Tokyo, Sao Paulo, Oregon, Frankfurt, or an Edge Cloud, which was really at the premises where the gamers were. And this thing had three parts. First of all, showing the concept of a mobile Edge Cloud, showing the latency that you get when you place it um, at regions very far away. But there was something more that I would like to show you. Here's an example. So we start the mobile edge cloud um, in the room. The ping time here is um, starting now. And now we move it from the to Oregon. The, the time is way bigger, around 100 millisecond. And what you see, the gamer here has a shadow, which means this is a diff difference between what he's really doing in the game and what the game server sees. So distance has an impact on latency, this is clear. But what is also interesting, once you're moving the mobile uh, edge cloud, uh, the, the game server with the mobile edge cloud, then this has some several gigabytes. And the gigabytes that you're moving suddenly don't cause any pausing in the game. You ju just see a flash between uh, the different uh, cities like now, but I know the game is over, but normally you would not see anything um, in between. So it restarts. So if you look at the um, at the switching point, it does not cause any um, severe pausing. We This flashing comes from us. We just had to tell the, the gamers we are now changing the game server to a new location. Good. But how to do this is quite interesting and um, we'll come back to that. And you will be also implementing your own mobile edge cloud dealing with this kind of latency issues. And we have done a way better version of that in 3D where you are now playing with virtual reality and um, inside a 3D um, sphere. The problem here is um, that you don't understand so nicely the switching points and the latencies as before. Nevertheless, it was a really nice game. Here you see the latency that is caused when you move, for example, from Frankfurt to the edge, from edge to Frankfurt, from Sydney to the edge, and where how this delay is caused and what you might uh, experience, what kind of delay you see. And this has to do with the time for authentication, for redirection, or what the server needs to, to start the service on the other side. So um, this is one cyber physical system also for Mobile World Congress and for Ericsson now. And here we show what the Mobile Edge Cloud um, is steering a, a controller, sorting some balls by the color. Um, up there, there is a um, camera. This is the sensor. This is the activator. And not surprisingly, the placement of the Mobile Edge Cloud causing certain delays will have an impact on the sort sorting result. Also something that you might find on YouTube. So this is the, another explanation or another demonstration where we had, um, we called it hot wire, where um, the outer robots will randomly go up and down and you can steer um, over a joystick the middle um, robot via a mobile edge cloud that we will then move to different cities, right? Um, London, Paris, and so on. And the goal is, of course, not to touch the wire, right? 
was another implementation of that. It's very important to show the audience that latency is an issue and that we should um, do something with it. Um, like you have seen it in Barcelona, this is a, an implementation of the Mobile Edge Cloud. Here you see a car that is steered by the blue Mobile Edge Cloud. And while the car is moving, we can see that the cloud is also moving. The reason for that is we would like to place the car as uh, the Mobile Edge Cloud as close to the car as possible to reduce the latency. That is not always the best solution because depending on the load status of this mobile edge cloud, it might be even better to stay where you are, right? Here we took away the city. Now you see the street, the cars, and the communication links and which ones are activated uh, in the moment and the mobile edge cloud is um, placed in a new way. And here you see the proximity is the reason why we move the mobile edge cloud. Good. The same is also done for a, a virtual world scenario with trains. Here you see the train and this very fast train. Therefore, we need a lot of um, mobile edge clouds serving it for multiple sites. And once the train goes out of reach, like here in the back, the mobile edge cloud will be re 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 replaced and move forward to um, be ready to take over the train in the, uh, at the next base station. Um, another example is the um, augmented reality. Um, this was something we also did for uh, Telekom and Lufthansa. Um, the, the idea is if you have this augmented reality, for example, here you see a worker that will explain you with the glasses what to do. Our task for Lufthansa was to use these glasses for getting away this annoying displays that are so um, bright the moment other people would like to sleep, right? So um, you can easily do this with the glasses. And once you have the glasses, not only is it the brightness is away for the neighbors, you can even have a way bigger screen right now, okay? So um, the other thing is you can have information, security information. It's a very nice concept. The question is where to place now this kind of um, complexity. Um, here's an implementation from um, Epson glasses. Here we use the camera from the glasses and bring it back to the phone, right? Something we did with another startup called Steinwurf. And um, it's pretty neat to see such a demo and to see that this was also then demonstrated um, on the way to CES in an airplane, right? But if you now look how you can realize something like this, you could imagine that, of course, you would like to have low latency, right? Um, you can do this if you have in the glass a lot of computing power in the app, but this will drain your, your battery a lot. And you cannot interact with other glasses that are close to you. So what you would like to do is to take away the mobile edge cloud and bring it to the closest base station. And now the, the, the apps are running here instead of the glass itself. That will save some energy, depending on how the um, RF basement will eat up for the transportation. But there's also a problem now with the latency. Before that, we had one millisecond. This could end up in 30 millisecond, right? Um, so this is not really what we would like to see. Um, we would like to have now 5G links, real 5G links with low latency. Therefore, you see the latency goes down. It will also have a positive impact on the, the batteries. Um, nevertheless, still you did not solve the problem how two glasses from two different persons, how they can interact. For that, you need some cloud infrastructure or network that contains the cloud. And now what you can do is you have a combined way of apps that are running on the glasses, on the base station and in the cloud. And this is what we call 5G holistic, where we can create some tactile experience. And here in this cloud, in the cloudified network, we have something like mobile edge cloud and network slicing to make this thing happen. Okay, next one will be the software belt, but after a short pause.